Good evening. Today we're going to evaluate and analyze the ballistic pendulum problem, the classic ballistic pendulum problem that you're sure to see in your physics class. We're going to solve for all the major variables that could give you trouble and do this all, do this whole analysis in the context of this problem, which is based on an advanced placement free response problem. We find that a block of mass M initially hangs at rest at the end of two strings of negligible mass at length L, as shown on the left diagram above, and then a bullet of mass M moving horizontally with a speed of V naught meters per second strikes the block and becomes embedded in it. After the collision, the bullet block combination swings upward but does not rotate. Find expressions in terms of the given variables and constants for the speed, we'll call it uppercase V, of the bullet block combination just after the collision. Part B, the ratio of the initial kinetic energy of the bullet to the kinetic energy of the bullet block combination immediately after the collision. C, the maximum vertical height H above the initial rest position reached by the bullet block combination. And finally, the maximum angle theta reached by the bullet block combination. And I will try to take as much time as is appropriate to explain each of the algebraic steps involved in finding these symbolic, that's non-numeric variables. Sometimes that gives people trouble. Let's begin then with the speed uppercase V of the bullet block combination just after the collision. Let's be reminded that there are two kinds of collisions in physics, elastic and inelastic. Elastic collisions you can use kinetic energy for, conservation of energy before and after. But those are only for the cases where the objects that are colliding bounce off of each other. In this problem, we have what's called an inelastic collision. Simply speaking, it's when the objects stick together, or as in this case, become embedded in each other. We cannot touch this problem with energy, but fortunately we can use momentum conservation of linear momentum in the x-axis, which is true. All the motions are in the x-axis, including the bullet, which is moving to the side, and the combination, which though it swings up eventually, immediately after the collision can be considered to be moving along the x-axis. So we use the easier method, conservation of momentum, to calculate this speed. I'll remind you that the definition of momentum is quite simple. It's mass times velocity. And allow me to say that the momentum before the collision is equal to the momentum after the collision. Allow me to say that the initial case is when the bullet is out here somewhere, and the final case is more or less what you're seeing here, where the bullet has just about penetrated and embedded itself within the block. Consider all the objects in play in the initial state. We have the momentum of the bullet, let's click, call it lowercase b, and we have the momentum of the block, let's call it uppercase b. After the fact, we have a combined object, the momentum of the bullet plus the block. But let's use that definition and make some substitutions. For the momentum of the bullet, I may put the mass of the bullet, which is given to me as lowercase m, times the velocity of the bullet, which is given to me as V naught. For the momentum of the block, I may put the uppercase M, but the block isn't moving, so I can put a big old zero in for the velocity. After the fact, our mass is essentially a combined object with a mass of lowercase plus uppercase M, and an unknown uppercase V, which we've been asked to find. We are good to go, as you can see, we may cancel out this term, leaving us m v naught is equal to m plus uppercase m v. And dividing both sides by m plus uppercase m, we find that the solution is m v naught over m plus uppercase m, which is equal to uppercase v. The final velocity of the bullet block system in the x-axis, the very moment that the bullet has embedded itself. With that said, we can easily tackle part B, the ratio of the initial kinetic energy of the bullet to the kinetic energy of the bullet block combination immediately after the collision. 
the ratio of two quantities means to divide those two quantities. The kinetic energy of the bullet before the collision is equal to one half m, lowercase m for the mass of that bullet, times v naught squared. Of course, I'll remind you that the definition in general of kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. But the kinetic energy after the fact of the bullet plus the block is equal to one-half. For mass, we have to put the combined mass of lowercase plus uppercase m. And now for v squared, we get to put our uppercase v squared, but see, we know better than that. We know not to just use an arbitrary uppercase v. We know that that value, as we just calculated, is m v naught over m plus m squared. We can simplify the expression as follows. m plus uppercase m in the denominator, and applying the exponent to each of these terms, we have m squared v naught squared over 2, again applying the exponent to m plus m, m plus m squared, which can further simplify because there are two m plus m's down here we may cancel with one of them up here. So knock one of those and we get the kinetic energy of the block combo to be lowercase m squared v naught squared over 2 m plus uppercase m. Now we have to divide this term by this term in the same order that they gave us here, initial kinetic energy to the kinetic energy of the bullet block combo. So Ke of bullet divided by Ke of bullet plus block is 1 half m v naught squared over m squared v naught squared over m plus uppercase m. You could also have the 2 down there, but just for simplicity's sake, I'll put 1 half. Cancel those 1 halves. Cancel one of these m's in the denominator, and then cancel both of these v naughts. Look at that. What we have here is 1 over m itself over m plus m. As you know, dividing by a fraction is equivalent to multiplying by the reciprocal. So our final ratio is equal to m plus uppercase m over m. Which is a surprisingly elegant result, given that it doesn't actually have any velocity terms in it. It's only in terms of the relative masses. And note that since the mass of the bullet would be really, really small, this ratio is quite large because it's effectively, you know, assuming this to be relatively um, not uh, very affecting of the whole fraction, relatively insignificant, we really have here something basically equivalent to the mass of the block divided by the mass of the bullet. And that's a big number. And that represents how much more kinetic energy is actually stored in the bullet on its own than is stored in the bullet block combo um, as it moves with its much, much slower velocity. And because this ratio is not equal to 1, of course, kinetic energy is not conserved, which is why I said a while ago this is an inelastic collision. I wasn't expecting that to be the case. That's usually what happens when objects stick together. As we begin part C, I'll point out that we no longer need to make any considerations about collisions or the type of collisions because once we have our known velocity of the bullet block combo, we can consider the motion from this point to this point a smooth motion where nothing comes into the problem to give or take away energy, which means we can use conservation of energy. And we can say things like EI is equal to EF, mechanical energy initial, is equal to mechanical energy final. I'll take away this I and F to establish that our new initial position will be this moment when the block has gained its velocity, uppercase V, and this moment when the block has gained its maximum height. And furthermore, I'll say that we start at a height of zero for the sake of convenience. 
Now let's talk about the type of energy that we have in the initial case. Well, we're at height equals zero. We haven't gained any potential energy yet, but we certainly have started moving. And we have kinetic e energy equal to one half mass times velocity squared, or actually one half m plus m times that known velocity squared. Remember in the simplified form, it was actually m squared v naught squared over m plus m squared. And we did that thing where we actually canceled one of those. So what we actually got was, and I'll just simplify it here for us, our initial kinetic energy would have been m squared v naught squared over 2 m plus uppercase m. That initial kinetic energy must be equal to the potential energy it has all been converted into at the top. And at that point, we've gained some height. That height, of course, is equal to mass times g times the h, mgh. But here the mass, of course, is m plus m, g, h. So there is an expression for the height. We must divide both sides by m plus m and g. And here's what you get when you carry that out. You get m squared, v naught squared, over 2 m plus m squared, and then a g for good measure. So there's an expression for your height. And that's already in terms of all given variables. So that will work for us. Now for the extra spicy part. Let's talk about this maximum angle theta reached by the bullet block combination, or maybe I should say the string of the bullet block combination as compared to the normal direction of the ceiling. For this, we'll have to do some trigonometry. Let's start by thinking about the nice little triangle we've made here, which features prominently angle theta. Its hypotenuse is a known quantity. That would be L. After all, you can't change the length of the string, whether it's aligned this way or that way. There's also this thing. It has an adjacent side. Maybe call it x. But simplify things, right? I mean, x would have to be equal to the length of the string that used to occupy this space, uppercase L, minus the height the maximum height reached by the block combo, L minus H. Or in terms of variables that we are allowed to report, L minus, not the previous expression, but here it goes, L minus M squared V naught squared over 2G M plus M, which was the result of our previous uh, part, part C. So there's X for you. There's an adjacent side we may talk about our inverse trigonometric functions to figure out this angle. We have an adjacent and a hypotenuse. So you should be thinking about cosine. Consider how the cosine of my angle theta must be equal to the adjacent x over my hypotenuse l. And consider my actual adjacent side x, which is none other than l minus uh, m squared v naught squared over 2g m plus m. I'm not going to go to great lengths to simplify this one, I don't think, but I will just express that the angle we are looking for by taking the arc cosine of both sides would be the arc cosine of L minus m squared v naught squared over 2g m plus m Make sure there's somewhat of a distinction between your lowercase and uppercase m's. All over L. The arc cosine of that ratio, or rather the arc cosine of that ratio that happens to fall within uh, 0 and 90 degrees. Okay, So if this has a numerical answer, if there are things you can plug in, your calculator will effectively give you the one you want, even though there are infinite solutions to the arc cosine. But this isn't an actual trig problem like in pre-calculus is it? It's physics, so you're just interested in the solution that is between 0 and 90. So I'll add theta is between 0 and 90 degrees, and I'll call it a day here.